previously on the podcast. But Andy is going to see this as a blessing. Mm. Mm. And it's going to set the course for yeah. your life going forward. Andy's child. Oh, my God. <laughs> yep, it's going to happen this year. What the fuck? Andy, let mom choose the kid's name, okay? Let mom? Do, I don't, what the fuck? Welcome back to another episode of Review. I'm your host, Ari Finling. Today, I am reviewing fatherhood. I'm talking about becoming a father, not some shitty fucking TV show on TNT or TBS. Let me first say that my daughter is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. <clears throat> now, having said that, what the fuck did I get myself into? I haven't slept more than three hours a night since she was born. I'm running on like 60 fucking ounces of coffee a day, which my doctor says will literally stop your heart. My daughter pisses and shits like she's a fucking horse. I should have named her fucking Barbara or Seattle Slew. The other day, I swear to God, I went to smell her diaper and she farted and a little bit of shit got in my mouth. No one preps you for how to handle your daughter shitting in your mouth. But when she looks at me and smiles, Ooh, boy. That'll melt your heart. This has been Review. I'm your host, Ari Finling. Good night. Yeah. There we go. And we're back. Andy Frasco's World Saving Podcast. Hey, huh? hey, hey. Um, Andy Petty Frasco. Yeah, <laughs> Andy P. Frasco. <laughs> Andy P. APF. Mitch. Uh, your real middle name is Mitch, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Drew Mitch. Maybe when I'm done with music, I could just be called Mitch. When you're like a mechanic. Like an old man. A mechanic in Calabasas. Hey, Mitch. Ah, uh, your Porsche <laughs> fuel pump went out. <laughs> Wait, did you, t- you work at a Porsche dealership in Calabasas, but you talk like that for some reason? <laughs> hey, I'm Mitch. I've been looking at your Porsche here. It's going to cost about uh, 10 grand to fix the fuel pump on that thing. Well, yeah, we got to fly it over from Germany. <laughs> How's your hearts? How's your minds, people? Nick Gerlach, my co-host. God damn it. Just been I'm just... listening to you be a little bitch for the last <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> well, how am I being a little bitch? I don't know. How do you do it? <laughs> how do you do it? Uh, you know, the whole world's out to get Andy. <laughs> Even though he Hill is a life that most people can only dream of. <laughs> Oh, what an opening to a podcast. We got a fun-ass comedian on the show today. Phil Hanley. I like him a lot. I like him, too. I saw him on another he, podcast, I believe, with Tom Segura. I can't he's remember dyslexic. Which. Or dyslexic? Oh, my God. Dyslexic. Dis- oh, shit. That's pretty funny that you... May, I feel like you do have something with that. Like, you, I do. But you read fine, but like, I wonder if there's a version of dyslexia where it's like you don't pronounce things correctly. There probably has to be. Wait a second. Am I been acting like a little bitch the whole morning? Yeah. Well, not the whole morning, but at least the last 20 minutes, half hour. I got to work on that. Well, it's just your manager calls you and you immediately go into bitch mode. <laughs> I mean, you're immediately on guard. You're like a cat. Like a, you're like a outside, like a stray cat. Because sometimes when he calls me, he's like, so what'd you do this time? Why am I getting a call from a manager saying you were going to give this band X show in Denver? In, First of all, he should December. know. He should know that anything a manager says to him that you said, he should just cut it in half. And that's because the manager's doing their job because mm. they're a salesman, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. And they should be lying. The manager's job is basically to lie without lying. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're lawyers. They're, they're, you know what I mean? They're, and then the, and maybe the booking agent's more like a used car salesman. You know? Then Brand came in at 10 a.m. like a bat out of hell. Yeah, she does everything like a bat out of hell. <laughs> that's why she's a good bartender. The only guy that just keeps me mellow, keeps me, me vibing is Bo Belinsky. What about me? You do, too. I keep you honest more than I keep you mellow. Yeah. You keep me mellow, he keeps me honest. You are such a bitch, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, hey, uh, is your mommy coming soon? Yeah, she comes uh, this week. Like when? Like She comes on Thursday. And then you're going to Bruce? Or no? Is yeah, that canceled going, now? No, we got, we got Bruce Springsteen tickets. At and, the ball arena? At the ball arena. Hi. Hey. <laughs> hey, yeah, we got a dog. Can you see him on the we camera? We got Denzel. Can, yeah, yeah. Hey, Denzel. This is my... Well, we can't really say his name yet because we haven't fully adopted him in case people are watching. So, Denny. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my dog. Yeah, he said he was going to adopt... He was going to foster... Get on, on that. Get on the couch. He's too cool. Come on, get up here. There you go. All there right, so... Is. Welcome. God, I've been bitching no, last two No, no. So see, guys? See, this is what he's been doing. You know what it is, though? I'm so nice to people all the fucking time. And when they're not nice to me and I just have to fucking, I have to like, <laughs> just take it. I, I'm just like, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm done just being happy, being nice to people who don't deserve niceness. Who's been mean to you lately? 
Oh, that drug Don't group. Go there. The Facebook drug group was pretty fun the other day. They protected me. A lot of those guys did. There's only two guys who were just one guy shit. was like this he, one he guy. He went after you too. Oh, he was just because like I I was like he's such a loser though. That guy was just like a you know, card carrying loser. We said we're not going to talk shit. We haven't really talked that much shit. How's your heart? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Speaking of hearts, how was the wedding you went to? Oh, that was fucking awesome. It was like a star-studded affair. It was probably the most star-studded event. Who was the biggest celebrity? That my friends were there that I got invited to I've ever been to. Who was the biggest famous celebrity there? God. Is there anybody crazy? I had a conversation with Zach Brown. A I country had, singer? Yeah. Isn't he massive? Yeah, he's huge. Aren't you into him, kind of? Jamie Johnson was there. I don't know who that is. Krasno. They put all our the jammers in one table. <laughs> Who's Jamie Johnson again? He's this really big country star. Oh, okay. Um, Greta Van Fleet was there. Holy shit. I yeah. didn't know Marcus was like that. Marcus is I mean Greta Van Fleet's like deal. the biggest band in the world right now, maybe. Yeah. Um uh Dan Auerbach from Black Keys was there. Oh wow. Yeah, they're and all then Briley's be there. family. I didn't really know them, but they were really nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really nice event. And it was just Nashville. such extravagant event. Yeah. It was at like the Nashville Symphony and Holy shit. Everyone's wearing cowboy hats and it was Did you wear a cowboy hat? <laughs> no. Nah. Well you need a cowboy hat. I did buy I wore my I bought some Gucci glasses. How much were they? Three hundred bucks? I got them for a good deal. I'm not gonna Watch say. in like a week there's gonna be some Gucci ad that's like pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> What if that's my thing? Every, Every time, time I buy a designer brand, they, they just turn into a something. pedophile. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they get in trouble for something. That'd be so fucking funny. <sighs> but yeah, it was nice. I went with Aaron Ray. Um, got Aaron. To, they sat me next to Maggie Rose, which was nice. I love her. She's the best. She's such a spirit. Yeah, I love her very and she's much. She's got an amazing voice. Yeah, and she's just a good person. Check she, her out. She works hard. She really does work hard. All the yeah. guys. You know, she switched up her band a little bit, I think. I really loved it. And you know who was really saying some really fucking nice things? It was Nigel Hall. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we, we're starting to become tight. I had a good talk with him at Mission. And Benny, too. They're like, man, we went to your Jam Crew show, and that was that Fun. was real special. They respect things if they're done well, even if it's not their thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They do. Like Umphreys or something? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, so it was star-studded. They had a tattoo artist, so you could get tattoos at like the Like a real tattoo, or yeah. not, like, not one that like fades out? Like a real tattoo artist. Did people do it? Yeah, it was, it was like... I'm surprised you didn't get one. I wanted to, but the waiting list was like two hours. Holy shit. And I was starting to drink vodka sodas. And Uh-oh, you can't really get a tattoo with alcohol in your blood, I thought. No. You're not supposed to, at least. But they're micro tattoos. Like, oh, they're, they're little not, guys. You get a full back dad. Yeah, like, at the wedding. Marcus King yeah. forever. King for King me. Was his band there? <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of buddies with his sax player. Yeah, his band was there. It was cute. They were all the best men. Oh. It was cute. Yeah, that is cute, actually. Yeah, it was really nice. He got married young. He's... 25? How old yeah. is he? But it was pretty wild. To, you know, they did the pre-party at Brooklyn Bowl, and that one was everyone was getting a little looser. Before the... So at, between the wedding and the reception, you yeah. all went to Brooklyn Bowl? Oh, yeah. that's cool. So it was uh, shooting the shit, drinking. Oh, Larkin Poe was there. It was oh, star-studded. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. It was pretty... I was like, oh. why the fuck am I here? Because you're getting kind of famous. You're more famous than a lot of the people you just mentioned. Oh, thanks. Zach Bryan. <laughs> Zach Brown. <laughs> <Or> Zach Brown. <laughs> oh, Zach Brown. <laughs> Yeah, not Zach Bryan. Oh, Zach Brown. Yeah. Little bit of chicken fry. A little bit of horn. And I like him because he hires, he hires my friends to be his horn section, so I like him. Yeah, he's a good guy. I had a good conversation with him. I like when other people get hired to play horns with famous guys. I love that. I like it. I didn't take mushrooms on this um, at this wedding. Yeah, it's a Nash they don't have mushrooms in Nashville, do they? I brought some, but I was kind of like... I was with. A no, you didn't. You found them there. You didn't fly with mushrooms. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God um, damn it. <laughs> but, uh... Me and Brian. I took Erin Ray. She was sweet. Yeah, I checked out some of her music. I liked it. Yeah, she's really, I mean, she's a star. She'd be cool to have on the pot again because she kind of came in the before times. Yeah, now that we're a little closer, I could start. I, I think it'd be, I think it's It's time to maybe have some before times people come on again. Yeah. Now that we're It's more, been a couple years now. I'll start I looked it up. It was 2021, yeah. Yeah, I'll get some more people. You know, because like, done. just a redo. Yeah. A lot of other pods do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um... But Nashville was fun. Then I flew to New York. I did the same thing as paying a fancy wedding, by the way. I played at New Conscious. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to New York and filmed New my York. music video. Oh, yeah. I saw you were in full drag. Yeah, I was in full drag. It looked great, actually. Yeah. Did I look pretty? Yeah, you looked good. I thought it looked pretty, I've just had too. sex with girls less attractive than that. Oh, man. You should get all that crazy. I haven't slept in a couple days. What are you not? You've been home. Oh, I slept last night, but 
It's just been like 5 a.m. flights. Oh, like, that, yeah. Maybe you should go to bed tonight at like 8. It's Friday night. It, yeah, so? I'm going out. You're, every night of your life is a Friday night. I know, but I'm in Denver for two days. Why don't you stay in and go out tomorrow and just have a double good time tomorrow? No, because if I do that, then I like Pussy. go f- full bender. If I know no. that I'm going to like drink All for right, two fine. days in a row, I'll I be guess like... I don't really care what you're going to do. <laughs> what are you going to do tonight? There's, what's going on? Um, I might just be at Cervantes like I always go. <laughs> <laughs> I played there like 18 times in the last two months. Yeah, you didn't want to come with me tonight. I'm going to go tomorrow for, uh, what's his face? What? Marimba Man. What's his name again? Oh, Mike Dillon. Yeah. That'd be fun. I always always accidentally call him Mike Patton. Yeah. We should have had him come over and do the pod. Yeah. Oh, I should have called him. He's a wild man. Maybe he'll come over tomorrow. Isn't he a wild man? Yeah. He's done the pod before. Speaking of things that mellow you out, dialed in gummies. Dialed in gummies. Go get yourself some dialed in gummies. If you're in the Colorado yeah, area. Man, it's live rosin. Live rosin. I love it. I mean, I really have been smoking way less weed. You have? Yeah. Like barely well, any. Because people in Nashville don't smoke weed because they're happy. <laughs> I was hanging out with Chris Galbuta. That guy's fucking insane. I like him a lot. He's, I love him so much. He's a good man. Man, he's so honest. And we were just shooting the shit. And I'm like, I relate to you, bro. He's like, I relate to you too. He's a good songwriter. He's one of the best out yeah, there. Yeah. But I was telling him about doubting gummies. I gave him a, a batch of that, and I was like, "These are good for creativity, and they are." Because like, I like taking yeah. a quarter if I'm going to be creative. I like taking a full one if I'm going to bed, and I like how you can know exact dosage of how much you need because it's homogenous. homogenous. Yeah, so you know what you're getting yourself into. So grab yourself some doubting gummies. Yeah, baby. Even Bo took a little mushroom today. How you you feel that thing? What? Yeah. Like a pill? They're cool. It's like point two five. What is it? A pill? I have this delicious. I got someone gave me Jake Plummer. No, like someone gave me this like delicious chocolate bar. It's like strawberry cream mushroom, and you should have a couple. I will try. I think I might go once this podcast is over. I'm gonna go uh, take a little bite and look at some trees and stuff. No, shit. you have to have a meeting first that we can't talk about. But I gotta have a fucking meeting. Yeah, and not a fun one. I know, but I'm gonna be honest in it. Yeah, but that's that's not fun. Being honest sucks. I know. Why is honesty so hard? Because lying's do? fun. You can do whatever. I'm a pilot. <laughs> See, I'm a pilot for American Airlines. Yeah. yeah, I've been working there for about 20 years. Yeah. Union, it's a good union gig, a great pension. Lying See, is so fun. That's way more fun. Lying is so fun. Also, being incredibly honest with people to their faces also can be fun, but they don't like it as much. Yeah, at the wedding, I had to lie a little bit. Oh, what'd you do? Because everyone's talking about their buses and their fucking... Oh, yeah, yeah, me bus. <laughs> me, <laughs> me go bus. Yeah, me, yeah, me too, man. I got a bus too. <laughs> yeah, we, what if <laughs> then your whole thing is... Then your whole podcast is bitching about your sprinter. <laughs> Yeah, I rent my Sprinter out to help pay for it when we're not using it. <laughs> <laughs> you want a dialed in gummy? <laughs> you can have a dialed in gummy if you want. Uh, I love them. What else did you lie about? That was it. I'm 6'2, was- I'm maybe 6'3. <laughs> He's so chill. So grab yourself some dialed in gummies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What an ad. Marcus King's like, I don't even need Yellowstone, <laughs> bitch. I live in a post-Yellowstone career. Hell yeah. Well. That guy's got a voice on him. Did he God, sing? He's so good. Yeah, he sat in with the band. Nigel, was, dude, Nigel Hall. He's the best. I, I low-key. Have you listened to his solo album? It's so good. Yeah, it's amazing. But like, I didn't, I'd never seen him be like the front of a band, you know? Oh, really? He wasn't at the keys. He was like right, right in front. Oh, he was like standing up and singing. And it was fucking cool. That is cool. Who played yeah. guitar? Krazy played a little bit. Krasno, and then, um, some like I get some super famous dude. I didn't know who he was, but yeah, I probably, like, was, I probably would have been like, "Whoa, that yeah, happens." You a probably would have known. I, and then there's I all these no people idea. you know. You're like, "Oh my god!" I'm like, "Who?" It's some singer songwriter. Yeah, I was really stoked about the dessert. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> it was so I good. loved dessert, dude. It was like an empanada caramel oh lollipop. My god, I'm gonna come. I love sweets. Me yummy. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like what was the meal? Oh man, they had all this fancy meals like uh, Dude. fishes and chickens fishes. and steaks. Yes, Aaron got a f- chicken, I got a fish, and we split both of them. Oh! Yeah, it was nice. Oh! And we were 30 minutes late to the wedding. Ooh. Mm. It was, that was not a good look. Did you that miss was... the ceremony? Uh, no, I was waiting outside for Aaron for 30 minutes. Are they Catholic? How long was the ceremony? Her Uber didn't show up, so she had to take her tour van <laughs> to the wedding. I love it. 
I you guys love are, Aaron is so funny. You guys are so dorky with your no tour bus. We love it. We both. I think I we relate to re- each other because she has to drive that fucking tour bus around. You should have rented a tour bus for the day and had it drop you off. It's so like you like fit in. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have some guy. How much? Like what? It's like a thousand bucks a day, right, or something yeah. for a tour. I don't know. I mean, you wouldn't have to spend much on gas. You're just going. For, just take it from your Airbnb or wherever you stayed to the fucking wedding, and then to the. I wonder how much they charge you for that. They'd be like. Thanks, Bill. You're like, yeah, I got tour I'll bus. Be, I'll be back at bus call at 2 a.m. for just, tomorrow's gig. Yeah, I'm just like you guys, tour bus. Too. You just rented it to fit in at the wedding. You're just having this guy drop you off in a full of fucking whatever they're called, Boom. coach. Stay. I was kind, I was kind of nervous. Actually, you could do that and just stay in it. Build your Airbnb cost into it. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me to your wedding, Marcus. That was really nice. Hell yeah. And if your saxophone player ever quits, hit me up. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, he's cool. I like Chris. Chris is cool. His dad is a killing. You know his dad? No. Same name. He plays keys with like Eddie Roberts a lot. Oh, dope. And Honey Island Swamp Band and shit. Oh, dope. Killing keyboard player. I uh, have a voice. I sent a voicemail per se, but. What happened? Uh, somebody sent in a text message with like a question for us. This was supposed to be a voicemail, but she was too scared that people would recognize her voice. Who? Who is this? I don't know. She w- didn't say. She's being secretive. When did this happen? I got it like a couple days ago. On the voice, remember the voicemail yeah, thing yeah. you can do text to. Hi, Nick and Andy. Love you guys and the podcast. Heart emoji. Wanted to leave you a voicemail, but didn't want, any, want anyone to recognize my voice. You said nothing was off limits, so. Ooh. There we go. I wanted to share something crazy that happened to me last weekend. And I also kept thinking, what would Andy and Nick say about this? After six and a half years of being totally single, 10 year relationship before that, I had my first ever one night. And morning fling. Ooh. Ooh, okay. Okay, girl. Get it, Queen. All right, Dan. All right, Dan. That's what we say in Indiana. All right, Dan. All right, Dan. Um, shout out Corey Fry from Main Squeeze. He likes to do that. With, it was with a. Ooh, oh my God. It was with a much younger, very hot, sweet guy. Is this you? <laughs> oh, he was in his early twenties. Never mind. And I am in my late forties. I like it. Okay, Andy's officially. But I've always looked younger than I am. He initiated it and pursued me. That's what made me think of this. He initiated it and pursued me. So reverse grooming. We have talked for an hour in the bar, and I tried to discourage him by telling him I was quite older. Lady, listen, you're not going to discourage a 22-year-old guy <laughs> by saying, I'm an older woman with a ton of experience, and I don't really care what happens after this. That's, all that did was make him want to bring you home more. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Hey, hey, uh, I'm an older woman, okay? Just so you know, you might not want to go home with me. a lot of experience. Just so you know, I'm just a... An older woman who lives by herself with a lot of experience, and you know, I'm not looking to get married or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, blah, blah blah. He kept asking to spend more time, and he ended up coming to my hotel room. And well, fire emoji. The whole experience was like a dream. He, he was gorgeous. His body was amazing. I'm starting to think you hadn't got laid in a while before this. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't stop thinking about it. But also, I feel like a terrible person because of the age difference. Don't you said he approached you? Also, he's over. 20? Yeah, no. Also, everybody, you know what? It is different when the woman's older. I don't care what anyone says. No. I, I, what is the most looked at porn? Exactly. Milf I'm not porn. saying it's not still bad, but it's much different when a, a 50-year-old rich guy is with like a 22-year-old. I don't know. Leonardo DiCaprio is also different. He gets a pass because he's too hot and rich. Anyway, <laughs> once you're hot and rich enough, you can do whatever you want. His body was amazing, and I can't stop thinking about it, blah, 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 blah. He lives five, six, oh. I'm sure I'll never see him again. He lives five to six hours away, but I can't get him out of my head. I'm trying to look at this as a sign telling me to put myself out there and try to start dating again. But how am I going to get this hot young guy out of my head? This was totally out of character for me. But honestly, if he called me, I would hook up with him in a heartbeat. What's wrong with me? I'm all fucked up. Help! First of all, nothing's wrong with you. First of all, nothing's wrong with you. I think this is (laughs) fucking empowering for her. Yeah, first of all, congratulations. Fucking yes. You're clearly hot. Get that dick. Like, seriously. Give him a call. Give him a call. I don't know. Don't give him a call. Well, I don't know this if you got his phone number even. Because maybe it was just for that moment. Yeah, And that's right. okay, too. One night stands are fine. When you... Yeah. If it's for the moment, that's fine. Why don't you text him and say... If but you're this ever, is giving you confidence, Here's what queen, you should do. That you are a queen. Run him a hot. Run him a short text that says, if, "Hit me up if you're ever in town again." Oh, I like that. That's it. That's cute. Just put the ball in his court, but don't be too aggressive about it. You're like, if you want, you know. Yeah. Bah. But I like this because <laughs> you know, like a lot, you know. I, I, well, huh. you like this because it's an older woman fucking a younger man. Yeah, and, which is you know, one of your favorite things on earth after the Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I made love with a 55 year old woman. Yep. We just talked about it three minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in my young 20s. You were, though. You were like 18, 19, which is the same. 19 and 22 are the same thing. Basically. I mean, women are beautiful. What the fuck? I don't understand what she's worried about here. I think it's because but yes, you women should. think when they get older, they lose their beauty. No right? way. A lot of people get like that. That's society. It's so fucked up. And women, I think, get prettier as they get older. The way that... Yeah, until a certain point, and then it really falls off. But, uh... <laughs> Don't say that. The way society... I'm just kidding. That happens to everybody. Like, I'm sorry, an 80-year-old woman is not... Uh, anyway, um... Uh, you know, it's just society, the way we treat... It's weird that we how we treat aging. And, I, you know, I, I hate... I was just thinking about I this. hate old people as much as the next guy. They're the worst, right? I mean, right. they are terrible, okay? Old right. people are the worst. But they should get a little respect for just surviving. Fucking making it. <laughs> God damn it! Right. There's fucking things washing up on the beach. There's things floating in the sky. There's pandemics. They have Vietnam War, fucking AIDS. Yeah, shout, by the way, shout out to old people. Yeah, give it up for old people. You guys are fucking annoying, though. <laughs> Why? Stop no. asking so many questions. Learn how to rotate a PDF, would you? <laughs> but, you know, but shout out for living so long. Yeah. You guys complain about people that are younger than you too much. I'm sure we'll do that, too, when we're old. Yeah. Boomers think everything's everyone else's fault. Don't get me started on boomers. Oh, come on. Nick. How about this dog, though? Such a great dog. This dog's a boomer <laughs> in dog <laughs> age. No, he's like 30, maybe. Oh, he's in his prime. Dude, he has... He's he, fucked a lot, you said, right? He's, yeah, he used to be bred, but not, it wasn't like a shady breeding thing he just was and do you uh, think uh we looked it up he's got a fair, fair share of kids out there get out there what well, do you think like the breeders like hey you're gonna keep coming until you can't come any longer that's why he's so tired he's like all right <laughs> i'm gonna pay for this <laughs> <laughs> look what is he's just like oh well, denny i wonder what dogs think about man do they think yeah, i hope so do you think I he's like thinking about mistakes in his past or yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> this is a fun opening. Yeah. Well, guys, thanks for cheering me up. Yeah, we've been on here. Out of the petty party. So. Surround yourself with people that inspire you. That sounds like some Andy Frasco lyrics on the next single <laughs> next year. <laughs> Love who you are and be who you are and get some dick. I got to get out of here. The hard, hard way. way. The hard way. All right, guys. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Enjoy Phil. Phil Hand. All right. Next up on the interview hour, we have comedian Phil Hanley. Yes, I love this dude. It it runs perfectly parallel with our podcast because he's a diehard Grateful Dead fan too. Um, amazing comedian. They call him the king of crowd work. Um, he's toured with everyone. He's from Vancouver, and uh, he's really into the jam scene. So I thought this would be a perfect parallel to get our listeners into Phil's comedy. So ladies and gentlemen, I think you're going to love this. We talk about everything. Um, his, his, gro his uh, growing up in Canada, you know, he has, he's dyslexic. Dilex I keep fucking up that word, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and he wrote a book about it. And um, he's going on tour and he keeps on getting better and better as a comedian as years go by. And I really think you're going to love this one. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the interview hour, Mr. Phil Handley. What up, Phil? How you doing, buddy? Hey, man. Hey, Andy. <laughs> nice to see you. What happened today, bro? Uh, no, it actually <laughs> happened last night. I, I'm in, I live in New York City. Uh -huh. I was flying home to uh, Vancouver. Um, and uh, it was one of those like weird flights where they, everything got on on time and everything, you're all like pumped to go. Uh, it was because it was flying to Canada. Everyone's like watching the uh, Canadian junior hockey team. We're, we're playing the <laughs> States yesterday. But, dude. Every, every, t everyone's watching it. I know everyone's like itching to order like beer. And, uh, and then we just, we remained on the runway for like the entire game. And, uh, so we, I, it, long story short, we just got in a lot, uh, later than, uh, a lot later than, than we, uh, than we were supposed to. So are, are Canadians like, are they as aggressive as Americans when it comes to their 13 year old? <laughs> kid hockey teams like, and stuff what yeah like i would say yeah like even more so like it's it it's funny i had stopped watching hockey i played hockey when i was a kid i probably stopped when i was like 10 uh -huh. and then i stopped watching hockey and I, and you know um up until that point you i'd watched it like you know 
through every, uh, all the time. And then I got back into it during the pandemic, I think, cause I couldn't leave the States and I got homesick and, um, yeah, it is. It like, it was cr- to see this flight. It, everyone was watching it. Everyone was like, you know, into it when like, you know, when the, when there was score, it wouldn't, it wasn't like cheering, but it was like, you know, very Canadian, like try to like remain <laughs> calm, but it's like, everyone was, Yes. 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 <laughs> quiet. Yeah. Yeah. It's so wild. You know, how was life living in Canada and like trying to be a comedian in Canada versus having you move to America? What was the difference in transition? Uh, it, well, it was, I, so I started in, uh, I started in Vancouver with the goal I watched. It, it was like, it's like my Rocky, the, um, the, um, the Jerry Seinfeld documentary comedian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watched that and uh, in the theater and kind of like walked home. At the time, I had done a little bit of improv and stuff. And then mm-hmm. I saw that and I was like, I want to be a comedian. I want to live in New York City. I want to work at the comedy cell. Like I want to like do everything that he did in that movie type thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just started so small. I started just kind of doing open mics in Vancouver. And then, um, yeah, there, I it's Canada's funny in the sense that like, it doesn't really in Canada. There's not like a lot of famous comedians or anything, but if you go to the States and then come back, you're certainly more celebrated, you yeah. know? So you kind of start in Canada, especially in Vancouver. Cause we're so far from the other major cities. It's just like, it's if, to, to use it, a hockey analogy is you are, you're like, you're not in a rink. You're like performing on a pond, like a frozen <laughs> pond with no, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The NHL is not a thing. It's just you and your crew. And um, I was really lucky to start here at that time because, yeah, people aren't doing it with the hopes of, you know, really, there's not like a ton, a ton of aspirations. It's really doing it for the love of, you know, going to these small open mics in Vancouver and and performing type thing. So when did you get, you didn't want, why did you decide to go to New York instead of LA? Because you're on the West Coast. Dude, I, I know. And I think about that a lot. I, I just really, I love New York and I, and I grew up, I started Vancouver. I started comedy in Vancouver. My family had moved out, but I grew up um, just outside of Toronto. So oh. I kind of grew up on the East coast and I had been to New York and absolutely adored it and needed a reason. Cause as a Canadian, you can't just move to New York. You need paper, like work visas and all this stuff. Right. And I thought comedy when I started getting, you know, somewhat uh, competent, I was like, oh, this could be my ticket to li- I finally get to live in New York. Yeah. So that, w- that was my goal. But yeah, living in, uh, being close to my family, stuff like that would have been nice if I had a, been able, if I had a swung it in LA. Yeah. You know, it's cause I grew up in LA and I was, you know, I'm touring and stuff. I want to go over, I'm, we're definitely going to go over your fucking fascination with the jam scene too we'll talk about that oh. here pretty soon oh, cool. but i want to okay. because i grew up in la and i feel like the comedians in la like one of my close friends is todd glass you know todd glass oh i one of my first touring experiences was open i don't know how i got so lucky <laughs> but todd glass came to play uh victoria and 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 courtney these two uh island like an island off of vancouver and i got to open for him and uh I uh, I love uh, Todd Glass. Todd Glass is like a national threat. Like he's yeah. just so funny, yeah, and original. And so, yeah. yeah, I know, love Todd Glass. So yeah, he was telling me about like L- I feel like comedians. If you want to do stand up, you know, L.A. isn't really the move. If you want to be a writer, L.A. is the move. But New York feels like you could really get your chops done. You could do the comedy sellers. You could do all, you could go, you could do like six, six sets in a night in New York yeah. to really build your chops. Is that important to you? Or as a comedian, you got to build your chops, right? Yeah, that was everything. Like ev- it was like everything for me. I used to like just do whatever I could possibly do to get five spots in Vancouver a week. And that meant, performing at like musical open mics that meant like just whatever I could do by any means necessary. I had to do five spots and then I got to New York and then yeah, you can do five spots in a night and you can do five spots. If you, no one knows you No, like, that's not just like Colin Quinn gets five spots. That's like, obviously the quality of the shows will, will be much different, but you can do 
open mic. You can do an open mic in the afternoon, and then like you know, you you can really just go as hard as you can, and you're in you're among other people that are going that hard, like open micers that are like tenacious and you're going to all the, doing all these spots. So yeah, that was really the appeal to New York for me. Yeah. Part of it. Anyway. It's fascinating. Cause I followed, um, I wrote, I wrote the music for Gary Goldman's, uh, special, uh, great depression. And dude, the music was amazing. Oh, thanks bro. I didn't know you did that. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Every, every aspect of the great depression was phenomenal. But I, I remember the music. I remember when he was driving into the city and stuff like that. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Thanks bro. Yeah. And I was like, I followed him do his, you know, it's like, it's so amazing. Even those guys who are just super, just fucking geniuses will go and do the, I followed him through all three comedy cellars. Then we went up to, you know, the upper West. Then we went down. I'm like, I feel like I'm touring New York city right now. This is yeah. fucking nuts. How did you, what was the, the transition between what you thought was funny in, in Canada versus what do you, what Americans thought was funny in New York? Did you, was there a couple of hiccups there? Like what, what uh, or did you know? There are, I mean, there are little things. My, my material, especially at the time I was doing very um, concise kind of like set up punchline stuff. So the actual jokes translated, but there were little things like, and I'm, I'm extremely dyslexic. So I, I still get them mixed up, but like we say grade three, and you guys say the third grade, is that correct? Yeah. I get one of them. But like, it would baffle, I will say Canadians are better at adjusting. Like if I say in Canada, sometimes we say washroom and you guys say bathroom, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? So bathroom, washroom, if you could say either in Canada, people will figure it out. But I've said washroom in the States before. And I know some places in the States, some people are listening, but that's what we say, but I have like baffled someone at like a Buffalo <laughs> Wild Wings where I'm like, may I use your washroom? And they're just like, I don't think we have one of those rooms. So yeah, like certain words, like just little things like that. Or I, I would get an addition and I would say, sorry. And they wouldn't be like, no, you got to say, sorry. They, they get sorry. If you're in, like just yeah. little things, but uh, material wise, I was lucky. Things kind of translated and, um, but my, it changed my style a lot, especially Eventually, I got to New York, and I worked and worked and worked. And when I got into the cellar, it, it the, like the cellar, like the comedy style is almost like, um, it's almost like the, uh, like oh, it's almost like the Ramones. Like it's like so quick, like better, 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 like you just get on top of the crowd and you punch line, punch line. You move very fast, right? And I remember working the cellar and then coming back to Vancouver, and my friends here just being like, "Dude, you're like." Your it your pacing is so different because you just want to get you you follow a towel or someone and you're like I got to get on this and just rattle out you know get the jokes it's like um a real pacing thing the room and the room is so tight you want to just hit them hard and quickly you know yeah and it's so funny like you know it's like it really feels like a basketball t I'm into sports I don't, you're into hockey right so it really feels like a a basketball tournament or a sports tournament where everyone's all in the same room. They're all kind of like, you know, they'll be friendly with you, but the, everyone wants to kill, you know, and yes. it must makes you feel like, Oh, I can't fuck this up. Tell me about your first time going to the comedy cellar. Who was on the list? Were you nervous? Uh, what were you dude, shitting yourself? Give me it all. I, I was so, so I was on the road. I was working uh, with a comic named uh, Kevin Brennan and he, I remember, this is how, like, green I was. That at, at one point during the weekend, he called David Tell, and it would, like, it blew my mind that I knew someone that, like, was talking to David Tell on the phone. Like, it was wild to me. And he said to me, he watched my act, and he said, I think uh, Esty, who's the woman that, that uh, books the cell, he's like, I think you'd like your act. So um, I'll, vouch for, I'll vouch for you. And then I waited a full year to just get the vibe in New York city and do all the rooms and kind of really, I did a full year and then I said, okay, I'll take the addition. And um, now a lot more people addition. There's just a lot. They have like four venues now at the cellar and right. so many shows. But back then it was still only a few people a year really were getting past. And uh, I remember I had my addition was at like 10 30 on like a Friday. And I was so nervous. It was one of those like, you know, when you have something big in a day and you wake up and your first thought is oh, like, I was just like that all day, <laughs> all day pacing, figuring. And then the process is daunting because, uh, 
Esty stands in the doorway. Uh-huh. You're on stage, and she, you do about five minutes, and when she when she's seen enough, you hit the light. As she will have the like the host kind of light you, or whatever. So you just like going, you know, it's about five minutes, and the, and then you will get the light. And then I came up, and she was very, uh, you know, it seemed, you know, you can just kind of tell if someone's laughed, been laughing or whatever, and. Um, yeah, yeah, so I did that, and then going from like struggling for five spots a week in Vancouver. I remember my first weekend at the Comedy Cellar, I got thirteen spots, oh, and I just shit. I couldn't believe it. It was like she texted me my spots. It was like one of the most. It was one of the, it was like the, one of the greatest feelings of my. Life. It felt like such a huge victory, and it had been such a long, you know, so many logging camps in the Rockies here in Canada, and all these like terrible gigs. Uh, yeah, it was such a beautiful feeling to to audition, and then you get your you get your um your sets like the following monday and it yeah it was uh it, i was like so moved it was amazing let's fucking go phil that's inspiring <laughs> dog let's go i fucking love it because everyone i talk to about sd is like they're so intimidated by her when they first meet her like what is it about sd you know because she basically can control if you get to play the best room in new york city so she probably is nicer than everyone you know when you first think of her head you know like She's so nice. She's yeah. so nice, but it, but it's, I think beyond her, it just represents, and it's not only like the comedy sellers daunting to a comic because you're like you sit there and you're like, oh, Patrice O'Neill like busted balls here, yeah. and uh, you know like just the history at the table and all the people that are there and like right Colin Quinn or people that you looked up to are on those shows like and it's a wild place. Like I have, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I once followed Amy Schumer who brought Madonna on stage. <laughs> and then please welcome to the stage from Vancouver, British Columbia, Phil. And like, it's just like, I followed, I'm like in the doorway watching and Madonna is on stage. Like it's, 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 it's insane. The things that, um, happen there and become, you know, normal. Like there's that famous show that was like, wh- who was it? it? Was like Kevin Hart? Was it Kevin Hart? Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, David Tell. Like it, yeah. it just, that was a show. Like people sat down and they were like one after another. And I yeah. think Aziz was too. like it was. It's a it's a wild wild place, and it's still the beauty of it's still there. Like CBGB's is gone. Uh, Fillmore East is gone you know um there's all these things and it's still there and it's still in its prime i remember five years ago thinking like these are the good old days and now you're like no it's still in the same place you know it's still those guys those people are still coming you know amy is still coming in to work on new stuff right yeah it's 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 weird like and i'm sure like with music venues you get that where it's like when so much amazing shit has occurred in a room yeah you can come feel it or something oh, yeah. like it creates like a vibe even like during the day with the lights on and you can still just like ooh, this is like hollow ground you know yeah i felt that when i when i first headlined fillmore west i was like i could feel you know jimmy and i could feel the dead in here it's just <laughs> yeah that's my dude that's one of my absolute dream venues i've only been there during the day I was there. There was it was they were having a Grateful Dead New Year's Eve party maybe like five years ago. Right, and uh, my friend works for Live Nation, and she took me in, and it, it was like all like the dead backdrop, like just the stuff that I'd seen since I was a kid on like videos, like the dead, like the giant Steely, and then like portraits of Jerry, and yeah, that's my dream venue. That must have been incredible. Oh, it's amazing. Before I before we get to the dead, I got one more thing. What's going on through? What's going through your fucking head when you see the lineup? You see Schumer. You see. I'm like, you, how do you pump yourself up? Do you go to like the stuff that you know is gonna kill, or do you like, you know, like I feel like you love jam music because of the improv and stuff and because of this spontaneous energy that comes to what the dead brought to the community. How do you, what do you, how do you, how do you, how do you set your mind straight saying that I'm going to fucking kill this thing? You, well, I, I mean, I have a, I have a, I have a stock line that always works and, uh, which was a riff, you know, I always uh-huh. say like, so say if it's like, um, Aziz, then Amy, and then I'm closing the show. I always go like first Aziz. Now I go first Aziz, then Amy. Now me, three in a row. 
And then Let's they go. always get, they're always like, and it just clicks them to know that I do a variation of that line. Cause it just clicks them to know like, Oh yeah. Like this is surreal for us and for him, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, often the audience is in such a good mood that if you ride that energy, then, you know, you can, you can kind of get through because people are pretty so like the eruption that, uh, the, and some hosts make a bigger deal out of it, but some hosts are just like, okay, everybody welcome to the stage, Chris rock. And the people are just like, rah! like yeah, 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 yeah. it's like the Beatles on Sullivan, you know, yeah. they go nuts because they paid 15 bucks and they heard that this happens sometimes, yeah. you know, or Chappelle or yeah. um, whoever. But I think you just, for me, it's as like, it is daunting or whatever, but I just keep it in my head. Like, they, they, those are the moments where you're like, oh, it is worth living in, you know, the smallest apartment in the world because right. you're in New York and you get to do these things. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And it's like, you know, I like uh, shit or get off the pot type of competition. Like, that's the best way to get good is when you surround yourself with people that inspire you. What was the worst bomb you had? You yeah. Had oh, the worst bomb. I mean, I've had like the worst. I the worst bomb I ever had was in Vegas. I was living in New York. I flew back. I had like a uh, corporate like Christmas party here, which are always a mistake because um, it's a group. The people that they work together, they don't necessarily, for one, have the same taste in comedy. For two, even some don't want to be there. Some just want to chat with their friends at work. It's the first time they've had a couple drinks with their friends. You know, the dudes they work with all the time. Yeah. And, uh, I was on stage and there was a table of like, there were like round tables. So, um, you don't, and you don't think of it, but the round tables, that means 50% of the audience is not facing you. So I had to have people turn around and, uh, a lot of people wouldn't. And there's a guy right in front of the stage was like doing motioning for all my jokes. And like, people were like, kind of, I could see them watching him, not me. Yeah. And. Uh, eventually someone must have said something to him and it hurt his feelings. They, everyone was bombed. The, the, the show was <laughs> sort of like, now it's like 8.30. Yeah. No, dude, everyone was bombed at this company and uh, the guy that was like, do, so I'm performing and then everyone's watching him and he's like doing better than me as far as like the number of laughs that are being received. Yeah. And then someone must have said something to him. He walks out of this huge... Um, like uh banquet room and then uh so the show gets a little bit back on track i start working and doing bits and then all of a sudden the door opens and he starts throwing um food from that was left over from because they had dinner in the hallway what? Get the <laughs> yes all of a sudden those like tiny tomatoes and pieces of broccoli he's like over it was like he had a hell of an arm on him man it was coming in and it wasn't hitting me <laughs> but it was just it was it was such it was such chaos and it's the only time that's ever happened to me i just was like i i because the thing you want to swear you want to and i just said I, I i was like it was very dramatic i was just like i've never been treated with such disrespect and i put the phone down and i started walk and i just walked out and then they all followed me and like were begging me to come back it was like it was insane. It was, oh my it was such God. an insane feeling. And it was insane because you're not, I'm not prepared for tomatoes to be thrown at me <laughs> and assess the situation. You know, when you're, uh, when you're on stage, you have this weird, like quarterback in the pocket yeah. math where you're like, I ha I was hating the gig anyways. I knew I had another 40 minutes of bombing. Oh fuck. And then this was my out. So when a part of me was like, this is beautiful because I was able to walk out and I knew I could say to my agent at the time, although that was the last time they ever booked me, I can't perform. Like, could you, that's like the five minute mark. You're having tomatoes thrown at you. Right. Can you imagine like the 30 minute mark when you haven't got it? Like, yeah. So that was worse. That was like a lot of adrenaline. And I walked out and they followed me into throughout the hotel, apologizing. And then the little guy that threw the tomatoes was like saying, sorry, it was like a whole thing. Oh, but, uh, fuck that, yeah. bro. Yeah, no. I know. Like, I know. is it worth the money? Like when you have like, then you're like yeah. PTSD of doing corporate gigs. Like, so whenever you get offered a corporate gig, you have that fucking image of this piece of shit throwing tomatoes at you. <laughs> you know? I know. I know. And, uh, no, it's not. I mean, and some corporate gigs are, uh, are better than others. Another one that was really rough was 
then this one paid well and they were really kind. They were really good people. I really wanted to do a good job for them. But what they did was they had a, like a, a it was like a three day seminar. And then on the third day, they had like their like banquet black tie dinner at like seven. And they thought that the, they thought the last um, kind of corporate meeting and stuff was over at five. Uh-huh. So they're like, okay, we're wrapping up me. And then they go, we have a surprise for you. We have a stand up comedian. And you could just see that on their face. They're like, ah, oh, you serious. And you could see like <laughs> women do the math. Like, Am I going to have time to get ready? And then I was supposed to do an hour. And they, there was nothing they wanted less than to hear my joke. Cause they were, it was like three days of corporate meetings and like <laughs> just fucking stiffness. It, it was just such a bad call on their part to be like, surprise. And you could just, everyone's just like, oh my God. And that was a rough one because you re- I really wanted to do a good job because they were so cool, you know? Yeah. That's so funny. You ever take psychedelics? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you ever yes. take them and perform? No, no. I took my experience with psychedelics, I took them very young. I started yeah. very, very young. And um, not like crazy young, but like pretty young, like 13. Like what were you I taking? T- acid, mushrooms? <laughs> Acid, yeah. In, in my hometown, like, you couldn't get, you could get acid, you could get hash, like this, like, really good Lebanese hash. We didn't realize how good it was at the time. Yeah. But, like, you couldn't get, like, pot, like, you couldn't get, like, you know, leaf. Yeah. But um, I, I was, when I was a kid, I was in special ed, and it was so uh, hard and so frustrating that I was so drawn to acid and I was like scared. I didn't know a lot about it, but I took it and, uh, just absolutely loved. Like it was just, it just, you know, like I think it suits some people and didn't suit other people. Right. For me, it was like, this was the break that I, this is like the break from having to drive to school in the short bus. This is the break from being, you know, in special ed, all this. It was just like, I had such an amazing time on it. And, um, yeah, and it's funny because I, I took it a lot at the throughout high school, and I always felt a little weird about it. I mean, the stigma now—it's like yoga teachers are like, you know, <laughs> microdosing L and shit. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird, dude. I have a bit about just like how like it was. If you took acid when I started, it meant you wore a leather jacket with a jean jacket over top that said something <laughs> about Metallica or Sepatira, <laughs> or right? And now acid is a woman in Uggs coming home from a, like a fast and a cleanse and a yoga class. And now she's going to trip. Like it's, there's like this spiritual, like, Oh, good. Good for you. Like, well, she really has it together where it was like, before that, it was like, it is just a matter of time before this child will be in prison. Like they will go to jail. This kid will go to jail. Of course she'll go to jail. Like it was the burnouts. It was like, it was all the dudes that smoked weed, but then it was like, the next level psychedelics were you yeah. know is that um, is that why you like the dead well i yeah i got into the i got it i was really into heavy metal and then i i remember hearing the name the grateful dead and being a kid and thinking oh the grateful dead these dudes are going to be so heavy <laughs> and then hearing it and being like this is not what I expected, but, um, yeah, I got into them then. And, and there's just no, I mean, I go to shows now. I don't really do, I don't really do anything and I don't need to, but the, the, to dose, I mean, the dead were founded in, you know what I mean? That was yeah. like, that's like in the mortar of what they are <laughs> yeah. is the genic, right? Yeah, exactly. So it is, I mean, for me, to take acid and to like, we would listen to the dead and then we would like just a skateboard on a summer night on like, there was nothing better for me when I was a kid, you yeah. know, cause I think I had a lot of stress from school. Or I know I did, but I always felt like dirty cause it was really frowned upon. Like it wasn't like cool or it was like, it was kind of the hardest drug you could get at the time. And I remember like older, my friends, older brothers would like say to their younger brothers, like, you know, be careful hanging out with like Phil. Like we heard he does acid and all this stuff. And oh I felt God. like weird about it until I, I, I had a, I was going to therapy and it was my therapist that pointed that out. Uh, my therapist was like, of course you took acid. You were losing your, like, you know, school had been stressful since grade one. And, right. you know, your learning disability, all this stuff. You wanted the biggest release that you could get. And it just clicked. And I was like. Yeah, that's all it was. And um, 
Yeah. And, and I was just lucky. It just agreed with me. Whereas there were dudes in my hometown that took it and it didn't agree with them. You know what I mean? Like right. some people take it and are never quite there. the same afterwards or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But for me, I mean, it's the quantity that I took is, uh, yeah, it was a lot. Do you think, like, yeah. do you think acid built your confidence? Cause I feel like, you know, you're, you're forced to go into special ed. You're forced to go into all these things. It kind of lowers your mind state of confidence. And you felt like you were just, were you, were you super depressed? Were you super lonely? Were you, what were you like when you were a kid? Well, I was like, I, I always did well socially. I was the youngest of two other kids. My parents, I, my parents, I don't know how, and I say this because I, I work with some organizations uh, that work with kids. There's an organization called Eye to Eye that works with kids with um, learning challenges. Right. And I, I've done, you know, some like uh, talks at their conferences and stuff. And the big thing, and sometimes parents who have dyslexic kids will reach out to me. And the big thing is to get through school. It's not designed. If you, if you don't excel at reading and writing, it's just not, it's not designed for it. Like it's not designed for a kid with dyslexia. Like yeah. it's just not designed for us. So you got to get through it. But the big thing is I'm like, if they can just maintain their confidence and somehow my parents, like I was taking the short bus to school and it's crazy. You're, you're taught like you're like, before you get into special ed, you have years of teachers just saying you're dumb or lazy or whatever. Right. And my dad, my mom would go in. My mom was very peaceful and would go in and like try to reason with them. And my dad would be like, you're goddamn smarter than them. I don't know. Like he somehow instilled this confidence. So, um, I don't know what, I mean, now when they talk about, uh, LSD and they talk about all the, you know, how it treats depression and anxiety. It's really interesting. You say that. Cause I don't know what it did. I mean, for me at the time it made skateboarding feel great and uh loud casey jones coming through the speakers Mm -hmm. sound amazing like that's all it was you know for me at the time it was just a break i would go to a party and do it i'd be the only one on it like it was my friends drinking whatever and i would dose and and have a blast so i wonder i don't know what it it did for confidence i know my, my parents really instilled like school sucks it's on them you're trying you're showing up it's just not in your wheelhouse as far as like skills type thing. Were you ever, what was the lowest, where, what was the lowest part of your life? You think, how old were you? Uh, I mean, dude, like from grade one, cause kindergarten went well. And then grade one, it was such, uh, a rude awakening. Like when I think of like that age, like when I think of me at that age, it's like, it's like a Dickens, play or like a, it's all yeah. it's in black and white like it's like oliver twist shit right it was like all of a sudden everyone was just like reading and writing and picking it up and i was just like nowhere and my teacher uh people even people say and i've had jokes about it where people are like you got to take that out of your act because it's so depressing at one point my first grade teacher took my desk put it at the back of the classroom facing the wall because i couldn't that's how badly i was spelling and she thought that i don't know humiliating me yes dude it's crazy so like the whole class would be going on and that would just be like she like she did her best if i think if she could have put me outside she would have but this is the farthest this is like the meanest thing she could probably legally do yeah the fuck i know dude it was it was crazy and and i was so my parents were my parents rule was if i got they would, if I got comments that said I was disruptive or anything, then that would be something they would talk about. But my mom was like, we won't even look, we don't, we won't even, they didn't, they wouldn't look at the grades, which would be like E, 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 D, maybe like a B in gym or like a C plus or something. But um, yeah. So I would say finding out that I was dyslexic was, and then there's such a stigma to being in special ed. So the day they like brought me into like the, um, you know, learning center or whatever, and had that t- t- tell me that I had to switch schools or go to special ed or, or whatever. Yeah, that was all pretty low. Like when I was a kid through school was probably the probably Were you ever worst. contemplating like suicide or anything? I mean, I had really dark thoughts. I don't know if I ever like put together how to do stuff, but I definitely wanted to, like I would, my, my sister told me that some kids are just smart 
like born smart or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'd always like pray that I'd like wake up and be able to read or wake up and be, you know, when you hear about those kids that graduate Harvard at 12, like that I would be able to get through school, but it was so depressing because it was, um, you would do the math and you'd be like, when you're nine and you're figuring out how many more years of school you have, it's, so, so monumental. Oh my God. Right? It's, it's like a lifetime. Yeah. You to go through school. Like it's, you know, so that was, that would have been definitely, that would have definitely been the darkest. But it, again, it's like something that I tell kids now or that I tell parents of kids with learning challenges. I'm like, if you can get them through school with self esteem and uh, without really getting in trouble, they are like a coiled spring. And that's, right. that's why I stand up because I was like, I will not do something that I don't love, you know, like I yeah. have to have, I have to each day be passionate and, and excited about what I'm going to do. Let's fucking go, Phil. This is what I'm talking about, <laughs> baby. Let's go. I love, I love a comeback story because now it makes sense why you took L cause you're happy in your brain by yourself. You didn't need the fucking insecure kids making fun of how you are educated to deal yeah. with that your life you're like fuck it i'll take l by myself and go to this party and laugh at colors and have fun with myself <laughs> like yeah, yeah that totally makes sense and i you know i i don't know if this is part of it but wasn't bob weird dyslexic dude it was such a monumental moment when i found out bob weird was dyslexic because uh when you're Kid, they tell you, when I was a kid, they would tell me Tom Cruise is dyslexic. And I'm like, what does that do? For, like, I'm, yeah, I'm a little <laughs> fucking star and top. Thank you for that. I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? I don't care. But I found out Bob Weir was dyslexic. And not only that, if you watch Bob Weir play guitar, it's such a different approach. Right. And it made me be like, yeah, that, that like, that was revolutionary. And it, it really increased my love for the dead. And, and I mean, obviously, like you cherish Jerry and, and but I, I loved Bobby so much, too, because um, he just was so eccentric. He seemed eccentric in the best way and, and just like such a unique um, person. And uh, I mean, I love you see those like 80s shows and he's playing like a pink guitar and wearing a Madonna shirt like he, yeah. he even rebelled. Dead, to be a deadhead and and uh you know you're gonna just travel and listen to your favorite band like it's right. such a rebellious thing to do and then on top of that bob would re- rebel against the deadheads you know what i mean like he wouldn't he's wearing big <laughs> short shorts and a madonna yeah. t-shirt yeah. like he's just yeah he's just the coolest dude yeah and you could tell that man got pussy you know when he was when he was younger i oh I I would imagine. I mean, he was, uh, yeah, he was an absolute heartthrob. Oh yeah, dude. He he'd wear. You know, he knew what he was doing wearing those short shorts. Dong was just fucking right there, bro. <laughs> yeah, like everyone is looking at Bobby's dick, dude. Bobby was the hottest guy in the band, right? I, yeah, abs- by far the hottest guy in the band. And goddamn, he could wear a pair of shorts. Like <laughs> I, it's like almost cliche when people comment on it, but if you look at him. Yeah, he's wearing like cut off, and they're not even like cut off Levi's. They're like cut off like Jordash. There was something that's like particularly <laughs> tight in the ass. Yeah. yeah. What, so tell but, me, yeah. did you follow the dead? I I got to see some shows. Uh, I mean, I've seen because by the time I was like, I've seen Bob Weir perform probably like like over a hundred times, like a hundred times. Because I would go after the dead after Jerry passed, I would you know, Bobby's had all these different bands and I would go, like I would fly from Vancouver to New York for three days to see, um, him play. And what, like uh, Capitol theater or something? Yeah. He, or like, I, I'd always go to the beacon, but yeah, I've seen them there. And uh, yeah, at, at, um, yeah, the beacon, he'd do like, you know, multiple nights or I would hear that like Phil Lash and friends rumored that, uh, Bob Weir was, I once went to New York on the rumor that Bob Weir might perform with the Shut the friend. fuck up. Yes. Yes. And it was amazing because I, I didn't have a ticket. And I was standing in front of the Beacon Theater. Everyone's in. No scalpers. I'm standing there. And I watch someone walk out of the one door and then go to the, um, like the will call or like where the ticket. And I remember jumping over a barrier and getting there first. And someone just left the ticket. And it was like center on the balcony at the beacon. Oh and as soon as God. I got I'm like, 
you know, squeezing through deadheads. Soon, as soon as I got to my seat, they walked out and Bobby was there. I was just like, yes. Oh my Bobby. God. Yeah. He, it's, it's like, I can I get so emotional. Like, um, you know, I'll be like talking to a girlfriend and just dead lyrics are so ingrained in my, in my head. And, and there's so many songs that I could, like, I can talk about moments at a dead show and just get like goosebumps or, um, did yeah, you ever meet him? Funny. No, I've never met. No, I've never met any. Like I always, there's a line in the dead song that goes, I shook the hand that shook the hand. If I meet someone that who has met Bobby, that's like a huge thing for me. Like yeah. if I met someone that has met, uh, we're. Or, now we'll uh, introduce you to Bobby. You're, I, we're going to get you. We're gonna, that, <laughs> that's going to be my goal is you oh. to hug Bob Weir. You could feel the indenture of his huge penis on your, on your thigh, buddy. <laughs> 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 I'm actually, I, I mentioned him so much. I'm cur- I'm writing a book about being dyslexic uh-huh. and uh, he, I, I'm sure my editor is going to be like, okay, we got to like trim the Bob Weir references from like <laughs> 1200 to 500. Cause it's just, I talk about him so much. What's it like writing a book? Dude, it's, 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 it's trippy because uh, it's funny when it, it, it brings you back. It's such a, um, like a cathartic thing to do because I'm writing about, I grew up in a really, you know, kind of, it was a a really kind of, it was great. The people were great, but it's kind of a shitty little town just outside of Toronto. And you, it really, when you start writing, it so brings uh, you back to your, you, you shocked at the things you remember, like that you remember conversations or what people said or what, like, you're like, how do I remember what that dude was wearing? So it's been really great to go back. I'm at about the halfway point. Um, it's really a lot of work for a dyslexic to to do, but it's I put on the dead and I just kind of sit down for you know a few hours every day and uh, and try to write it out. But uh, I'm 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 it's fun writing it, but I love the idea of being able to like tour with it and and to talk right. to people about. It's basically just my favorite topics in one book. It's a positive look. It's basically the positive look on having a learning disability. It's like, I wouldn't be talking to you if I wasn't dyslexic. I wouldn't be a standup if I wasn't dyslexic. I wouldn't be, you know, traveling and and doing all these things. So I really owe the shittiest part. What I thought was the shittiest part of my life turned out. It's funny when you give things enough time, you realize how great they are. You know, they can actually be a great thing. Yeah. You know, is it, you know, we talk about suppression. Like when we're kids, we kind of like block things in our head to make us not think about it again. Was it hard to like bring back some of those memories of when people were just fucking making fun of you or were you, are you like strong enough in your head now through all the trials and tribulations of, you know, bombing and following your dreams that this is just another chapter in your life? Yeah, it's, well, that's the beauty. The thing that I love so much about comedy and, and I'm sure it's the same with songwriting is, and, 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 and just writing is that like it, it's you have the ability to rewrite if you if something shitty happened to me when i was a kid and then i have a bit about it all of a sudden that wasn't a shitty thing it was like inspiration for like a good thing you know yeah. so it's fun you can kind of rewrite um these things and certainly like the book to me is like uh, it's such an opportunity and uh to talk to other people with dyslexia and stuff like that is is something that I get to do now, but I'm going to be able to do a lot more of that. And it's just something that I really like to do. So it's, it's funny when you use that shit, it becomes a positive thing, you know, like even if I don't have kids, but if you had, you know, a rough time when you were growing up and mistreated or whatever, and then you get to like take that lesson and then treat your kids. Right. I think in a way it almost makes that, your experience, it kind of puts a bit of a positive spin on it because you're using it for something good, you know? Yeah. So that really is what happening when I'm writing the book. It's like, thank God all this stuff happened, right. you know, Man, or I wouldn't be here. Exactly. Man, kids are such assholes. Kids. Yeah. Like I, for me, it was weird. Like I somehow, and I, you know, credit my parents and my sister, I, I was able to like, socially, I was always fine. Um, but yeah, in school, yeah, kids can be, yeah, they're just like, I had to fight to prove that I was like cool enough to hang or whatever. But for me, my experience was with teachers were really, 
I mean, this is back. This is way before anti-bullying was like, yeah, they didn't, you know, I mean, yeah. So for me, it was, I had my worst experiences with, uh, teachers and then yeah, kids would, if you get off the short bus, kids are going to be shitty, but I was able to kind of get in with a group of people along the way. I was always lucky to be able to make friends often through music. You know what I mean? Like if you're a young kid and you're really into music or you love the dead or whatever, you meet someone else that is, you could really connect because it's most of the kids were into like cartoons or whatever, yeah. you know? And, and it kind of fucked up that they put the kids with learning disabilities on a short bus. Dude, it's what the fuck so, is that all about? It, it is so fucked up because like, that's the thing that I, that, that is that like, cause then adults like they don't real. It's like, would you want to be on a fucking short bus? They no. take a school bus. And then they do design the car, the clown car version of it. And they're going to fucking put kids on it. It's so cruel. It and it's is. Like, it's like, okay, so you struggle in school. Now you're about to struggle in the schoolyard. Like it's, 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 <laughs> it's fucked brutal. up. Dude, it's, fucked it's, so, up. it's so brutal. And the way they, like with me, um, I really wanted to, uh, I, so they put me in the special ed school. It was a regular school, but it was a special ed class. And I really wanted to, um, it was my first opportunity to learn music. I really wanted to study. And they, instead, because I was in special ed, the woman kicked me out of the class in front of the whole class. And it sucked because even as a kid, I'm like, no, I can't read, dickheads. Why wouldn't you try to find something that I can do? You know what I mean? And because you're in special ed, no one has ever studied music. I'm like, that's all we should study because we weren't doing anything else. Yeah. You know? But, um, Man, yeah, fuck it, these people. Yeah, yeah it, I, I feel like people are more, um, sensitive to, to kids with, um, learning differences now. I hope so. I mean, the big thing is that parents accept it. So, yeah, it's crazy, man. I mean, Phil, I, I'm so thankful I met you, bro. You're a badass. Dude, it was so, I'm so glad to have met you too, man. Yeah. I got one, I got two more questions. Is that cool? You got time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, Everyone says, you know, I, I, everyone says you're the king of crowd work. You're the man at crowd work. Like this improv, the- it's really, I, I've, and then I did, you know, I, Bert's, Bert's a homie of mine. And I, I listened to your podcast with Bert and uh, I, you're, you are something very special. And um, I was wondering about crowd work. Do you think you're so good at crowd work through the improvisation of what the dead did? Well, I I list like I listen to if I'm writing, uh-huh. I can easily listen to Forty Hours of the Dead a week. Like I, I just p- put it on; it's my work music. And I really, when I started comedy, wanted to take. I just admire them so much, and and I love that it's a different show every night. And um, I, I it's I think it's seeped in because I try to do, and it's like. You you would only see it if you were me, but I try to do because I I like I like to riff with the crowd because um, it, you're so in the moment. Like it's like um, uh, once Bobby uh, Bob Weir said he goes uh, he he goes like the thing he loves about music is it makes time go away. Yeah. And when you're reciting the same joke, and I'm sure if it's when you're playing the same song over and over again, it you lose that a little bit. But when I can riff into the crowd and use them to come back into another joke, totally. you know, like something they say that to kind of transition. Um, I, I like to think that that's just because I admire the dead so much that I like to think that that's where their influence lies in, in my comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like, I don't know if it's too grandiose to be able to say, you know, I feel weird saying it, but I would love to think that, you know, that's where I've got it. But it, it, it is easy to, to see, some similarities in that because I do look when I'm performing, I look for that place to, to riff, you yeah. know, and I look for that place to bring in the audience and, and uh, the Grateful Dead really did that. The audience was really part of the show. Of the show Cause you would go like, they were the visual aspect. Jerry's wearing track pants, <laughs> you know, like, like it's not, there's stage. There weren't like, come on guys, let's get some like matching outfits. Jerry's wearing track pants. Uh, Phil Lesh wore track pants for many years with a t-shirt tucked into them. Like it wasn't, they weren't like, let's 
spectacular. It was the, uh, it was, you were listening to the music and you were, you know, watching a little bit, but you're watching the people around you and stuff like that. So I really try to bring the audience in. I really try to establish that Carl's up front and Sarah's going through a breakup over here. And these two guys, this couple here met at a gas station. And I like to be able to bring it all in together, together you know, that, that, that's, that's, you know, on a good night in a perfect world, that that's what I try to do. And I, I love to think, that that is uh, something that I learned from the dead for sure. That's, it, that's in my head. I love to have some connection to them. You know, is it harder to build that intimacy on big, in bigger rooms? It's it. You can do it. Like I I when I I mean I'm I play clubs unless I'm like opening for uh, you know like I opened for Aziz for uh, a couple years on and off. We would tour together and stuff like that. It is a little bit harder, but when I it's it's more daunting. Yeah, but when get used to it and uh hopefully i'll be fortunate enough to play bigger venues i will figure out a way to do that because when i do kind of take that risk and try to get into the crowd in in a big venue like that right um you can do it you know and it's just establishing they can't see the person you're talking to maybe Mm -hmm. but it's just establishing talking to them in a way that that the rest of the audience understands kind of what's going on yeah it's fast that shit's so fascinating Nating to me because like you know i'm i'm really bi- i'm i'm a musician but i i'm obsessed with the comedy that's my thing i love how how comedians approach a set how co- comedians approach when it's time for them to just do some straight improv you know that's that's the stuff i look you know like as a coach like i love phil jackson that's my guy you know i oh, grew up in la yeah, yeah. it's fast yeah he's a he's deadhead, deadhead. Dude. Yeah, yeah hell yeah him and bill um, yeah it's just fascinating how they, um, you know, how they control egos, and like you could basically do that with crowd work, and you could do that in your own show with that same philosophy. And I'm, I'm just, um, yeah, I'm a fan of you, Phil. Thanks for being on the show, bro. You're the man, dude. I, I, I appreciate. Uh, God, I had a blast talking to you, and I really appreciate being on it. So I, yeah, I I'll message you. you on Instagram, give you my number. Let's fucking hang, bro. You're in New York a lot. I'm always in New York. Are you are you based in New York or LA? I'm in Denver and New York. So I live in Brooklyn oh. when I'm in Den- when I'm in New York. Dude, come to the comedy cellar and we'll we'll have dinner and we'll Yeah, let's check do it. Out. And I'll take you to the Cap <laughs> Theater. And you know, like all my homies are the Brooklyn Bowl. Like I'll show you the insides of the Cap Theater. Yeah. Oh dude, I'd love to go see J Rad or something. Yeah, let's do it, dude. Let's do Russo <laughs> or we'll do a Phil Les show or something. Oh, dude, I love that. Thanks, brother. No problem, man. Phil Hanley, thanks for being on the show. I got one last question that I like to end the show with. Um, when it's all said and done, uh, what do you want to be remembered by? Whoa. Uh, I mean, in, in the work has just begun, but I would love to... Um, I mean, the two things... I don't know if this is what I would want to be re- remembered by, but I would love... Two things that I would love to do is... Uh, build confidence of kids with um, dyslexia and, and um, be remembered as someone that brought, you know, knowledge and uh, broke, broke some of the stigma of that dyslexia is a terrible thing. Cause I think it can be, mm-hmm. uh, I know it can be a positive thing. And I'd love to think that um, I turned people on, you know, people who were like the grateful dead and then, you know, checked it out and we're like, Oh wow, this makes me feel great. I fucking love it. Thank you, Phil, for being a fucking ambassador for the jam scene. I appreciate it, buddy. Thanks, brother. It's so great to talk to yeah. you, man. I can't wait to hang. Please message me with your number and stuff. Yeah, and I'll do that right now. You. Have a good one, Phil. Thanks for being Thanks, on the brother. show, bro. Have- Later. And now, your Planned Parenthood moment of the week. You can pick up Josh. All I was asking you to do was pick up those three parts. Stop. You don't get to watch TV. All I asked you to do was pick up those three little pieces. I can be a big jerk. Yes, I can. Stick your cock up her ass, you motherfucking worthless. I told you to stop. Because what you just did, I don't think you get to watch TV. It burns. Yeah, and you yell at me for telling you to shut up? Please, yeah. I didn't even tell you to shut up and you yelled at me. 